Today, we are launching a campaign called He For She. I am reaching out to you because we need your help. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. is Impact 10 by 10 by 10. It's about engaging governments, businesses, and universities, and having them make concrete commitments to gender equality. Hello everybody and welcome. Good afternoon Facebook fans. We are live from the Facebook offices in central London on International Women's Day. It's got to be your story. It's got to be how you personally can make a difference. The smallest gesture goes such a long way. We're putting the movement in your hands, turning to you to help us create a world in which gender it's just a spectrum of beauty and not limitation. And we're committed to increasing the representation of women all across the company, all across the globe, in both technology positions and also in leadership positions women actually not only contribute in terms of the participating in the labor force, they drive entrepreneurship. You know, you can't really find peace in the world if 50% of the world is women and they're not included in the same conversation. my letter to her, so he for she. Okay, that's amazing. Yo, it's Lynn, and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half, like women are like half of the people on earth. And yes, they should have been equal since birth. We believe that students should leave university believing in, striving for, and expecting societies of true equality. And part of this liberation movement requires that we call out and break down these social norms and barriers to our well-being so that we may all be free to be our true selves. There's power in embracing everything we feel. These traits don't make us a man or a woman. They make us human. Thank you. That was just great. Um, I wish that I was Lin-Manuel and I could um, deliver my remarks in a more, uh, I don't know, poetic way than I'm about to do, but um, I still, uh, I'm delighted, delighted that you're here. Uh, and I'll deliver my mark remarks instead as just a regular faculty member and leader of the university. I'm so pleased to welcome you. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President of University Life at Columbia. And I'm thrilled to welcome you here, those of you who are in the room and those of you on the live stream, to He For She Columbia, a discussion of gender equality in STEM and academia. The conversation that we are about to have is essential for our time. 
we have seen so much progress in STEM, in academia, and in so many areas. And at the same time, as everybody here knows, ongoing challenges that require our serious and sustained attention. So one of the great lessons that I have learned over time, both in academia and in the civil rights advocacy that I have done, is that to make change, especially when we think about how do we reduce disparities, how do we engender justice, to make those kinds of change, how do we enhance equality, one of the most important things we can do is have conversations. Right, taking the step to have conversations is, a necess is necessary. It's a necessary first step, and it's necessary in an ongoing way. Conversations that <clears throat> interrogate where we are, that explore, that imagine and envision and reflect the kind of world in which we would like to see ourselves. A vision of the kinds of changes that we would like to see, whether in our own lives as individuals or in the world around us. And that we, in these conversations, think both about the vision for change and about the barriers that we dig in and explore. What's the, what are the blocks and how can we work with them and overcome them? So there are two parts to this idea of conversations as an essential tool for change making. One, the first is that the conversations need to take place on many levels. Right? These are conversations we have in small, daily ways with friends and classmates, with our professors, with our colleagues, with our advisors, and also in larger public settings like these ones. Each, conver each type of conversation, each level helps inform the other so that what you hear today, we hope, is something that you will be able to take out in your conversations with classmates in labs, in studies, in hallways, with friends and family. And, add, and that you will be able to bring ideas from this conversation into those. And likewise, that when you are in the next large group conversation, whether it is in a setting like this or online, that you'll be able to add ideas from those conversations back into the bigger group. You could think of it as positive directional feedback, a positive directional feedback loop. The second part is in addition to having the conversations at many levels, it becomes essential when we're thinking about reducing disparities and increasing equality, is that conversations are an especially powerful tool when they include the variety of people who will be needed to open up these visions and then to sustain change going forward. And this doesn't mean, of course, that every conversation has to have every single person in it. Uh, there is a very important place for the smaller individualized conversations to have with each other. Yet if we stay in those conversations all of the time, part of what we miss is to see the fabric and to create, participate in creating the fabric that will lead toward the sorts of changes that he or she is all about and that we are all about here at Columbia. For this reason, at Columbia, we are so excited to partner with he for she for this event, to bring this conversation to you, and I am personally very excited to see the sparks fly of new ideas as the conversation takes hold. Turning to our own community, uh, if you don't know already, you should know that Columbia is among the nation's leaders in Ivy League universities and in universities around the country and indeed the world in women's participation in STEM fields. And I know Dean Boyce and the other panelists will tell you much more about that. But what I want to say at this moment is that today's event also gives us a place to acknowledge and recognize and celebrate the tremendous leadership, faculty research, and students who we have engaged with these issues. You'll hear formal, re formal recognitions of our panelists or introductions from two fantastic Columbia students, Maggie Gleason and Irina Karkanis, in a moment. I do want to acknowledge our panelists now as they are uh, just in, in, in an amazingly impressive bunch. Dean Mary Boyce, who leads the Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science and is just a tremendous leader at the university, across the entire university. Professor Helen Liu, Vice Chair and Professor, professor of Biomedical Engineering. Professor Carol Mason, who specializes in, in pathology and cell biology, neuroscience and ophthalmic science, and is a leader of the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. Vice Provost Dennis Mitchell, 
uh, who's a vice provost for faculty diversity and inclusion at Columbia and senior associate dean for diversity at the college at uh, Columbia's College of Dental Medicine, where he is also on the faculty. And Julianne Pelot, uh, strategic senior advisor to the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. I will leave to our panelists to focus on the incredible opportunities for students here at Columbia. I want to share, though, that when I look at the opportunities that students have, that researchers have, that faculty have, I feel more confidence than I than before at, at the uh, possibility that even with all of the challenges our world faces, Columbia students and Columbia faculty and Columbia researchers and alums will be in the lead of the problem solving that we know is so importantly needed. It's now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Nyamayaro, head of He for She, which is a global solidarity movement that seeks to engage men and boys as advocates for gender equality. Elizabeth is also senior advisor to the Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. She's a strong advocate for women's rights and economic empowerment. Her connections to the UN began as a child when she first encountered UNICEF and UN AIDS workers in, in her village in Zimbabwe, which was undergoing a drought. Since then, she moved, maybe she'll tell you this too, but she moved from her village to the capital and then on to England and to Geneva to study and work. She's had an inspiring career, including working at the forefront of African de the Africa's development agenda in the public and private sector. She's worked with UNAIDS, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and so much more. It's, we're honored to have you here. Thank you so much. And I'd like all of you to join me in welcoming Elizabeth Nyamayaro. Good morning, everyone. I said good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be here today, and I would like to start by acknowledging the President Lee Ballinger and, of course, his office for hosting us. I would also like to acknowledge Susanna and uh, Mary Dean uh, uh, for having us at this campus today. I'm excited to talk to you about gender equality. <laughs> But first, I want to share a very simple story. Off the coast of Japan are tiny islands where resident monkeys have been under continuous observations. The scientists provide supplementary food to the monkeys, but the monkeys also feed themselves by digging up sweet potato and watch eating it with dirt and all. This uncomfortable practice continued unchanged for many years until one day, a young male monkey broke with tradition. He carried his potato down to the sea and washed it before eating it. He told the trick to his mother, who taught it to her mate, and so the culture spread throughout the island until almost all the monkeys, let's say 99 monkeys, were doing it. Then one Tuesday morning, the 100th monkey acquired the habit, and within an hour, monkeys on other two islands in two physically unconnected populations who until this moment had never shown any inclination to wash their food, also wash their sweet potato. In 1975, Leigh Watson, a South African anthropologist, published his theory about the 100th monkey effect stating that ideas in human societies spread in the same kind of way, and that when enough of us hold something to be true, then it becomes true for everyone. Sadly, this is not yet the case for gender equality. Whilst more and more people agree with the idea of gender equality, we are yet to create the same critical mass that's needed to have our own vision of the 100th monkey effect. We are yet to engage every single man and boy as true allies for gender equality. We are yet to build a truly solidarity movement for gender equality that is welcoming to all of us. A movement where the voices of minorities and women of color are welcomed and valued as equal. A movement where the concern of those who fall on the gender spectrum are given equal attention. We are yet to fully realize 
as humanity, our potential, because we fail to recognize that despite our differences, what we share is more powerful than what divides us. I had a really interesting moment when we did the Get Free Tour in the UK. I met this young man and asked him a simple question. What does gender equality mean to you? And he said this to me. It means being able to order a sparkling cider without any judgment in a pub. To be honest, this answer almost threw me off completely. I thought he was going to say something more profound like, ending gender-based violence or having you know, equal pay for equal work or even better still, access to education for all girls. But he said none of those things. He said, for me, gender equality means being able to order my sparkling apple juice, cider, also known in the UK, in a pub without judgment. I failed to understand the connection, so I probed for clarification. He got silent, looked down, and softly said the following. I was raised with very traditional values, you told me. My father and mother never drank alcohol, and neither did my brothers. It was the way that we were raised. But then during my first week at university, I went to a pub with a bunch of guys from my class. One of the guys ordered beer for all of us. He asked me to drink. And I say to him, I would rather have a sparkling apple juice instead. The other guys laughed at me. And the one guy who had offered me beer called me gay for asking for apple juice. It was embarrassing for me, he said. I ended up drinking the beer anyway. It was the first time I ever consumed alcohol. And later that evening, I was walking back home to my dorm. I lost control and sexually assaulted one of my female classmates. Since then, I've never gone back to the pub. Since then, I've never seen the boys in my class and hung out with them. Since then, I feel quite lonely. It was quite a lot to take in, and I remember thinking, if something as trivial or small as the things that we eat and drink are used as an insult on our gender or as a way to demean us, then we have a lot more work to do. And this is why UN Women, through its He For She movement, is trying to create a world in which we can all be free to be our true selves, to be strong and emotional, to be vulnerable and real, and this is critical, especially at this current moment, where progress towards gender equality is in fact moving backwards. According to the World Economic Forum's 2017 report, it will now take us another 217 years to achieve equality in the workplace. And that's a 47-year setback from the 2016 data point. So if we want to change the world, we must get serious about change. We must create environments where human rights are fully respected and where power is not abused. Environments where opportunities are worn and sustained through merit and not because of one's gender. We must ensure that there's impunity for harassment of anyone regardless of their gender and in some cases, their non-gender. And we must go further and break down incremental change and accelerate progress, for example, applying temporary special measures until women are all at the table. And that becomes the norm and not the exception. Until any hiring manager, any voter, makes their decision based on the best candidate for the job and not because they are either male or female. We must carry on until we have more women, study, more girls studying STEM and more, more women in STEM uh, professions. Globally, women are less likely to enter and more likely to leave STEM careers. Furthermore, we know as the United Nations that 53% of women who start their own businesses in tech fields end up leaving them for other industries. And that's not because women fail to do the job or that they cannot lead. No, it's because we have created spaces in which they cannot. We have created exclusive spaces that permit and continue to foster selective access to power. And this needs to change. 
Later this morning, you will hear from my colleague Julian on UN Women's work around the world in advocating for that kind of change that we want to see. The work ahead requires all of us. And as we stand at this crossroad with an ambitious agenda ahead of us, we must make sure that we take the right path that would lead us towards a gender equal world. We, of course, count on you to work together and, of course, with us to create that change. It's a true honor to be here today, and I want to thank you again for having us. I should pay more attention. I'm supposed to introduce our awesome students to uh, continue the conversation with a panel discussion, and I'm going to introduce um, Maggie and Ariana to come and introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we discuss gender parity in academia, specifically within the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My name is Irina Karkonis and I am the United Nations Liaison for Columbia He For She, a student organization right here on campus that works closely with the international movement. My name is Maggie Gleason, and I'm the co-president of Columbia University's He For She chapter. He For She is the United Nations Global Solidarity Movement for Gender Equality. As a student organization on campus, we strive to fight for an all-encompassing gender equality that is intersectional and inclusive. We aim to start difficult conversations, challenge gender stereotypes, and engage everyone, especially men and boys, as agents of change. Just this past April, we spearheaded an international intercollegiate conference with college representatives across Mexico, Canada, France, Australia, and several states in the United States for the first ever He For She Student Leaders Conference. Today, we look forward to continuing our conversations that we had there about how best to engage in discourse about the challenges that many women still face in STEM and how best we can promote gender parity within STEM, both at the international level and right here on our college campus. Please join us in welcoming our wonderful panelists today, Professor Mason, Professor Liu, Vice Provost Mitchell, and Julian Pillow from UN Women. I am pleased to introduce our amazing moderator, Dean Mary Boyce. Mary C. Boyce is the Dean of Columbia Engineering and the Morris A. and Alma Shapiro Professor. She leads the education and research mission of the school with more than 200 faculty, 1,600 undergrad students, and 2,700 grad students. While dean, she has significantly expanded the faculty, funding for faculty and student research, programming around entrepreneurship and design, and initiated a robust set of renovations to education and re research spaces. She's also launched an inspiring new vision for the school, Columbia Engineering for Humanity. Dean Mary Boyce. Thank you. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here today and, and to really to lead this panel. Um, I'll start by saying a few words and then each of our panelists and then we'll have a conversation. <laughs> So I, I want to start um, really with a very positive message. Uh, so first, I want to really encourage young people everywhere to really be thinking about engineering and applied science, all the STEM fields, as really a path for your future. This is probably the most remarkable time uh, to be an engineer, to be an applied scientist, to be in this field. Right? We all know and can feel every day how engineering is impacting the lives of people around the world. Uh, we call this at, at Columbia engineering for humanity. Engineering bringing our impact on humanity, on the sustainable issues in the world from water to air uh, to energy to healthy humanity to connected humanity, how we connect with one another every moment of the day, it seems now, is, connect, is accomplished with engineering uh, development. Secure humanity, when we think about all the natural disasters and when we think of, about cybersecurity. And creative humanity, that as engineers, as scientists, as applied scientists, 
We are really creative and we enable creativity in so many other fields today. So this is not just a great time for women in STEM, it's a great time for men in STEM, it's a great time for all young people to be seriously thinking about this foundational opportunity that lies before them. So now I want to say some really um, positive things about the outlook for women in STEM. Right? I think this is a positive time. We are seeing uh, emerging increases in numbers of women pursuing uh, engineering degrees. Uh, and uh, there's a few universities uh, in the U.S. who I think have really uh, been leading the way, uh, and Columbia is one of them. So I want to just go through a few, a few statistics on what we're seeing at Columbia Engineering. So when we look at our undergraduate student body, we are right now over 43% women at Columbia Engineering in our undergraduate majors in engineering and applied science. In our entering class, we have 49% women. I mean, that is a pretty remarkable statistic, right? And I also want to back that up to let you know that if you enter Columbia for an engineering and applied science degree, there's a 95% chance that that is the degree you will leave with. And this is a really rigorous, difficult field. And so to, for us to have the success in graduating, a student entering, with that as their inclination, it's, it's really fantastic to see, right? And this is critical for the whole pipeline, right? We see a few universities who are reaching this parity at the undergraduate level, but for it to really stick, we've got to percolate that across the country to the larger state schools, and, and that's where, you know, a next step at the undergraduate level is, is how do we really take that further? At the graduate level, we have 38% women, uh, 30 in our master's program, and about 24% in our PhD program. So you can see the pipeline issue, right? We're drawing from across the country and across the world uh, for our graduate programs, and so we, we need to be increasing those numbers as well. So while I'm, I say we have a very positive message, we also recognize there's still a lot of work to be done, okay? And we all need to be in this together. Okay. Because this pipeline also feeds the faculty line. Right? So we are at about 18% women faculty in engineering at Columbia. Uh, and you know, we, we want to do better. We need to do better. And every university needs to do better. Right? Because the presence of women attracts other women. Right? And so that's another message I want to get across is I think this, the sense of the visibility and the presence of women, the critical mass issue. Maybe not the 100th monkey, but the, the, maybe the 50th monkey, right? There's some point where it's the critical mass before we get to the, the complete mass. Um, that's so important because there's a subtlety, right? I'm not the social scientist in the room. I'm just someone who's lived this as her life. There's a subtlety that, to the presence of other women and being successful in attracting younger women to, to go to make that decision to pursue this area. Uh, and I think that that's something that's really so important. And you can feel that here at Columbia. Uh, and now I want to say a couple things along those lines on the he for she, right? Because I think it's as important for our male students uh, to have this female presence as it is for our female students. Right? Uh, the men learn side by side as equal partners with the women. Right? They each benefit from, e from all the different perspectives of one another. Right? And they also uh, are, understand the equality because they're living it. They're living it in the classrooms, they're living it in the laboratories. So when they graduate, they go out into the real world okay, and can serve as ambassadors. Right? Because they know how it should be, okay? And it isn't that way out in industry. So that's an, another thing, is how do, we, how do we get more women out into the tech workforce, the engineering workforce, and how do we move them through the ranks in those workforce? Okay, so that, that critical mass 
First has to be there at the undergraduate level. That's step one. But we have all the other steps to make, and we even need to be percolating step one a lot further than just a few universities. So, so um, when we think of that, I want to contrast it to, to my, my own experience. Okay, so, so we're going back a few years. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say how many, but when we look 30 years ago, <coughs> Um, you know, as an undergraduate, it was not unusual to, 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 to be one of one in a hundred, or one even <laughs> more than one hundred in a classroom. Uh, and so, so not the, not nowhere near the hundredth monkey, <laughs> the first monkey, I guess I was. But, but the, the sense that, um, you know, that for me, the fact that I loved math, I loved physics, this was what I loved to do, um, it was a fantastic field to be studying, right? And every one of my engineering faculty instructors was a man, right? So there was he for she for a long time. They were really supportive, they were really encouraging, and they were inspiring, right? Not every one of them, for sure, but you don't need every one of them, right? You need to have the, the right number who are there for you. And in graduate school, you know, numbers diminish there as well. You know, my, my mentors, my advisors, my thesis advisors, my committee members were all men, okay? So there was he for she there as well, right? So uh, critical, critical people in your life, in your career, and amazing people, really supportive, really encouraging, really inspiring. Um, so there's a really critical aspect of, our, of your male colleagues, of your male mentors, and they can really make the difference. And it's, uh, so, you know, I want to point out there's a lot of positivity there um, that we need to recognize, and th those elements are still critically important to every woman student and, and every male student. Uh, so this sense of uh, he for she um, is, is, travels with us through our career and, and, and through, you know, through every experience we have. I also want to comment on the incredible support of women for women, all right? The, the, I guess maybe we should call that she for she. <laughs> that um, while uh, in, in my um, career, you know, very few women undergraduates, very few women graduate students, in the early part of my career, very, very, very few women faculty. And, but every one of them was supportive of one another, okay? An incredibly mutually supportive group, right? They were there for each other, and we're, we were in it together. And I think that's another really powerful message that women are in it for women, too. So there's he for she, but I want to emphasize that we've also had she for she, and that that's been really important. Um, during my time when I was um, at MIT for, for many years, um, where I started, was a grad student and uh, started my faculty career, that was also the time of the, the, some very famous MIT reports on women in science and women in engineering. And that was really women uh, coming out of the, their isolated labs, working their, you know, their hearts out on their research to come together to articulate where were the needs to make a difference in, in faculty. So again, also she for she, but that had to be supported by he for she because it had to go up through the leadership ranks, uh, where, which was, was all men, by the way. Uh, but it also shows men supporting women at, at, at critical times when the exposure uh, was so clear. Um, so I think there's some really powerful messages and then how that has really, you know, fast forward to today and what we're seeing today um, and um, uh, particularly at, in our undergraduate ranks uh, uh, approaching really almost equal numbers um, and then how are we going to percolate that through? So I think there's just uh, some really incredible messages that we have and stories, but the visibility of women um, is so critical 
okay, to attract other women, okay, and to also be changing the atmosphere, flipping that stereotype, okay, and, and, and that, the influence that has on men and the support that men can be providing in this is also critically important. So I have lots more I can be saying, but I'll, I'm going to move on with the, the conversations. And, and, um, and we want to hear from each of our, our panelists. And we'll go one by one, and then we'll sort of articulate a, a conversation with one another. So we were going to start with Carol. So, so, uh, so Suzanne introduced everybody. So, uh, so I'm going to go on first name basis of, uh, and, and just start with Carol here. Hi, I'm Carol Mason. Um, I'm a neuroscientist here at Columbia. Um, I've been here for several decades. Um, I went to a women's college. I have sisters, and I have always been interested in the advancement of women in science. Um, I also had uh, male mentors all along the way who were really he for she in a big way. Um, and I think that's true here at Columbia as well. Uh, I've been a co-director of our graduate program in neurobiology or neuroscience here, and um, I've had lots of undergraduates in the lab uh, from both Barnard and Columbia, and um, I think we're in pretty good stead in the life sciences and in neuroscience. Our numbers are perhaps better than they are in engineering. Um, we still have some challenges. So I'm going to talk about some good things that have happened in recent years in terms of training um, of neuroscientists. First of all, in our graduate, our PhD program, we have about a 50-50 ratio in terms of our incoming class, and it stays that way until, until they get their PhD, finish their theses. We have a little bit of drop off in the numbers of women who go on to do postdoctoral fellowships. Um, a lot of the men do, about 85 to 90 percent. In recent years, we've lost a lot of the our men and some women to tech, of course, um, Google, etc. As you may know, big data, including in the neuroscience field, is very popular. Um, about 75 to 80 percent of our women go on to do postdocs. Um, and I'm happy to say that in the last two years, four of our women PhDs have uh, garnered positions as assistant professors at Rockefeller, Princeton, and NYU, which is a remarkable feat. And um, our graduate program, by the way, is one of the, I would say, top few in the country in neurobiology. Um, another great thing that's happened in the field is that the numbers of speakers at conferences and um, small meetings and large meetings have absolutely increased. In fact, you cannot get a symposium mounted at the Society for Neuroscience. Our society has over 40,000 members unless you have gender balance. Um, and in the last three weeks, I've been at several international and national meetings, and I've heard the most spectacular talks delivered by younger, mostly younger women um, who are on faculties. Another thing that's happened here at Columbia, and I think around the world, uh, talking to my colleagues, is that the students, especially the women students, ask for, are asking for more mentoring, more training of men and women in implicit bias, in conflict resolution, and of course the events of the last year have stimulated these conversations even more. Where, um, the Columbia um, our staff and faculty are extremely responsive, and we're going to be mounting um, pro more programs in training and in accountability, actually, for our, both our faculty and students and postdocs alike. So these are all good things that are happening now in the field at Columbia um, and, and in our program. And another thing I'd like to say, actually, in terms of training, is that it used to be that one, one end of neuroscience is based in quantitative analysis, theory, computational analysis. And it has been a pretty male-dominated field. Um, lately, many of our female graduate students have gone into this. And our one, two of them have Google fellowships. Um, and so now, uh, this, is, this is expanding. 
um, into the, that is female students, and uh, we hope faculty will expand this field and to have more gender balance. Then the other end, which is molecular and cell biology, where there are a lot more women. So where are we, though, with our challenges? I just want to say that we at Columbia, as in every university and every university nationally, want to hire more women as faculty. The trouble is our ads go out and we get 100 to 200 applications for junior academic faculty positions, and maybe about 20% of them are from women. And we're not alone. This is true across the board. So what happens between the postdoc and the applications to be a faculty member? I think, and Dennis Mitchell will talk about this a little bit, a, a lot of it has to do with the not very great work-life balance we have in terms of childcare, um, in terms of just uh, 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 policies for both the father and the mother to take time off. We're working on it, we're getting better, and Dennis will address this. I, a second uh, problem in, in, I think, across STEM fields is that um, either you go on to be a faculty member after you've trained to be as a postdoc, or um, uh, you, if you want to stay in science, it's extremely difficult because there's, there's very little opportunity to stay on as what we call a staff scientist or an associate research scientist for very long. The universities and the governmental agencies have to step up, in my mind, uh, to the plate in terms of supporting these positions, which are largely occupied by, would be largely occupied by women if we had them. So I think those two things, childcare and the availability of, of academic positions where you don't lead your own lab, um, would help maintain women in, in academia, at least in the life sciences and probably in the engineering sciences as well. Um, so um, I think I'll, I'm going to end there by saying that things are looking up. We are very embracing of, of the welfare and, the, and the, the mentoring and the training of women in, in our areas here at Columbia. And I, I welcome all of you to, to come and talk to people who are in the fields of life sciences and, and in neuroscience. Um, we've just all moved into the Zuckerman Institute, which is right up the street at 129 and Broadway. It's actually one block above 125th Street and Broadway, that glassy blue building. Um, and come and talk to us and learn more. We're hopefully going to start some new undergraduate research programs so we can have you there. And also at the Medical Center, there are, I would say, two thirds of our neuroscience faculty are actually on the medical school faculty. So I'll stop there. Okay, wonderful. Helen. Helen? Hi, um, good morning. Um, I think uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, I think from, from my perspective, I have some personal stories to share. Um, I come from, I think we're called the baby department in the um, 150, over 150 year <laughs> history of the engineering school, uh, the biomedical engineering department. I did actually, it was also unusual in my experience that I did all my undergraduate and graduate training in bioengineering at Penn. And uh, it's one of those majors where they're actually, I was thinking back, you know, last night about my graduating class from Penn back in 1992. Was, there were eight women out of 24. So you know, there was a third. Unlike mechanical engineering, I think there was one. So, you know, the one monkey. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, I was pretty sheltered in that way because when I went to graduate school, there was you know, at least 40% uh, in our major, there was a lot of women. So you didn't feel um, isolated, you know, at least at your level. But it's true that there was no female faculty member. There was no female, all our professors were male, you know. They, and and, and I, I think I was, didn't notice much. You know, I just sort of did my thing, I did, and went forward. But uh, one thing was interesting that when, um, the year before I graduated from uh, graduate school, um, we hired one female faculty. So and she was on my thesis committee, you know, that was a big deal. So it was very exciting. So, you know, ever since then, I, I had many great mentors who are male, and um, I also appreciate the fact that they didn't mentor, I didn't feel like they mentored me because I was female, but rather that they mentored me because I was their student, and I felt you know, uh, very well cared for and very, very well, very inspired. Um, then I did my postdoc, and 
a great experience. My mentor was uh, Cato Lorenzen, and he was amazing. And he gave me the freedom to explore academically and really cemented my beliefs that, hey, maybe I want to go to academia. So then I w went to academia, and um, I came to the U.S. Department in the, uh, at Columbia. And uh, at that time, the department was formed in 2000. I joined the faculty in 2001. So I was the first female faculty hired, um, and then also eventually also the first female faculty to, to get tenure uh, in the department. So and I was think, you know, thinking about this before, it's always not the first that you really want to be associated with, right? But that's what it was. And, um, but it was uh, also very really interesting, it was also the first time that I became aware of um, quote unquote the gender inequity because, um, you know, as new faculty member, you know, there was like a faculty gathering that the dean's office was hosting. So, you know, every, you, first year you go, you know, you go to the, so, uh, one of my, I came in with uh, Andreas Helscher, and the two of us went to this uh, gathering, and uh, just chatting, meeting people, and one of the faculty members, you know, uh, shall, shall not be named, said to me, oh, you know, uh, after we chat for us, uh, do you work in the dean's office? <laughs> and I was very surprised. I, as long as it was my first encounter of this reality check, hey, you know, somebody thinks I work in I said, no, I, I didn't. I don't work in the dean's office. I said, I'm a new faculty member hired uh, in, the engineering, in the biomedical engineering department. So I, I think, you know, I look back on that. I, don't, I think you know, he was very apologetic, and I feel like we all learn, right? We have our perspectives, and then something changes, and then you adapt, and that's a learning moment. It's a teaching moment. So I think. In many ways, I think that's um, a culture that was really interesting in engineering school that evolved over time. Because being the newest department, within two years, we hired another female faculty. So now we have five out of uh, 22 who are female uh, faculty. And they're, all of us are, are, you know, are tenured and, so, and, and full professors. So I think that that perspective is, is really nice to have that critical mass that you can share uh, experiences and also think about what to do next and also to work together, you know. So I was graduate chair for five years and uh, many of uh, my female you know, faculty, we worked together to bring events for, for female students and because we feel that was important to do and I think to have someone else who also wants to do that, is, that was fun, right? It makes them more interesting. So I'm happy to report that in my department, uh, the latest statistics we have is Beta Engineering School statistics <laughs> is that we have uh, two thirds of our undergraduates are women, and uh, you know it's a, it's a very uh, it also beats my own statistic you know more than 20 years ago. So that's <laughs> that's progress, right? So and the graduate program is parity, 50-50, just like the uh, natural sciences, and I think um, but we're. I think the challenge is just as Carol and Mary mentioned, it's really where, how do you, you know, plug the leaks along the pipeline as you go forward uh, to the next stage. And I think there are many things that we can do and also that we're exploring because no one knows what is the perfect solution, right? Because uh, The Economist, I think last year, published an article uh, on uh, gender pay gap. So apparently, I think in most developed countries, uh, for the same job, women are getting paid 95 to 98 percent of what men get. So there's, you know, there's a lot of progress that has happened. But what is sort of problematic or troubling is that most women, they still have lower pay because they're in lower paying jobs, right? So they're uh, in nursing, teaching, and um, uh, executive assistants, right? Because those jobs offer flexibility. Uh, in caring for families, in having a family life, you know. So when you're on tenure track, um, from a female perspective, the first seven years is critical. And from, you know, so you're what, 28, 30 years old when you're coming out of grad school and, uh, or postdoc. And this is also reproductive, you know, from a perspective of having a family, that's also your golden years. But you're going to spend that time pursuing a, a tenure. So I think in many ways you're handicapped from the beginning and I think there are a lot of policies and Columbia is actually extremely progressive um, and I've been very fortunate I think, to work with uh, Dennis Mitchell on, on the diversity council in sort of making some of those changes to enable that happen and also the, to, to, uh, to ensure that we, we can plug the leaks uh, in the pipeline. 
All right, so I, th I think um, now we'll hear from Dennis, and I think he he'll talk about some of the things that, like ex the extending tenure clock, many things, advances that we've been doing uh, to actually to uh, help, help with some of the issues that, that Helen has discussed, so Dennis. Thank you, Mary, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to the He for She movement. And it's a movement. You really are a movement. So thank you very much, and Suzanne, for the invitation to share a little bit about what the portfolio at Columbia University is related to faculty diversity and inclusion. And uh, it is, uh, I think, we're at a pivotal time here at Columbia. Uh, we have uh, a, a really a perfect alignment of our leadership that sort of recognizes, I guess we, be, we begin by sort of recognizing the challenge and having that awareness, right? And then committing real resources to be able to address the challenges. And then having a plan in place to implement those resources so that you can get to success. And a year ago this month, uh, the university you know, made an announcement of a new $100 million commitment dedicated just to faculty diversity and inclusion over a five-year time period. And as sort of groundbreaking as that was, uh, the, a part of the story that was left behind was that the decade before that, the university had already committed $85 million to this effort. Uh, so this $100 million commitment, as wonderful as it was, really added on and just added to what was really a now $185 million commitment of the university. And that could not have happened without this sort of perfect alignment where you have a university president, a university provost, and a board of trustees that are all aligned and committed to this work. Uh, so now really the challenge becomes how do we deploy these resources now that they're in place? And it has been, there have been challenges because some of our challenges go into the depths of individual departments where change must occur, right? When it's all said and done, uh, nothing can occur just from on high, right? The president's office by itself cannot make the change. We have to go into the depths of our departments. So that's what we've put into place. And when you look, we provide resources so that we can have targeted hires of women, uh, especially women in STEM fields, but women all across the academy where they're underrepresented, as well as faculty of color who are underrepresented across the academy. Uh, so we've targeted resources specifically for those hires. But hiring isn't enough. Uh, so we also have in place resources that allow for retention of those faculty. We are not the only university with resources to bring aboard women in, or faculty of color. So we, we are well aware that our peer schools are also trying to do the same thing. So we must make sure we have resources in place to help uh, in the case where others are trying to uh, come after our faculty, our wonderful faculty. Um, but the most important of all of that is providing resources so that our faculty can thrive, right? It, it's not just about, we always hear recruitment and retention, recruitment and retention. I agree with that. Recruitment and retention are critical, but we are working to provide an environment where our faculty can actually thrive here. And that's by creating sort of a climate, what we call a climate of inclusiveness. So we also make sure to put into place policies that help women in particular, but all faculty. Uh, and those include some of the things that we've, we've heard today, right, where we're looking at policy enhancements for childcare and daycare, policy enhan enhancements for maternity leave, policy enhancements for uh, ultimately for flexibility in faculty life. Those are all critical. Uh, extension of the tenure clock for tenure track faculty. Uh, that is a, a critical aspect, especially for women, but it really does affect all faculty on some level. And, and I think these are, it, it's so for us, we want to make sure that we have policies in place so that we can help our faculty. And then we also want to make sure that we're doing academic programming and funding scholarly endeavors that highlight issues related to women. 
that highlight issues related to gender and sexuality, that highlight issues related to faculty of color. Uh, this is a particularly important time where we make sure that we have scholarly programming that allows students, faculty, staff, the community to come together and have these discussions. Because if we're not having that kind of environment at, at a university like Columbia University, who is supposed to do it? Uh, so we're making sure that we're putting resources in place so that that can occur. All of it together provides this sort of environment that is welcoming, that is inclusive, that is progressive, that we hope uh, is the kind of environment that not just allows us to attract wonderful new faculty, but allows them to not just want to stay here, but thrive here. And I, I, so we've, we've been working really hard. There's lots of senior faculty. Helen has been just an incredible resource. I actually see Ann Taylor from the Medical Center in the audience, who's another critical adv senior advisor to our diversity committee uh, that helps us really strategically plan how best to not just deploy the resources, but to put in place the policies that will allow our, our women to, to do well at this university. I, I want to take a personal minute to talk a little bit about the Medical Center because I've been a faculty member at the Medical Center 28 years now, so a very, my entire professional life. And I will say that when we look at the progress of women at the Medical Center, we have full parity, and the Medical Center doesn't have undergraduate students, right? So we're talking about graduate and professional students. We have full parity across all of the four medical schools, uh, medical school, medical center schools. That's medicine, nursing, uh, dental, and public health. Actually, of course, public health and nursing are well above parity. Uh, but we have full parity in those schools. When we look at junior faculty or early hires, we're seeing movement uh, that's really exciting over the last decade. Where our challenges are, are in senior faculty positions and in leadership. And that's where we have to continue to do work. And uh, it, it, the Medical Center has been putting programs in place, and we are really excited to see sort of new change there as well as we sort of begin to target efforts towards leadership and women in senior ranks at the Medical Center. So it's an exciting time across the university, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to share and look forward to your questions. All right. Wonderful. And Julian. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and, and, and thank, you, thank you very much for, for inviting me to join the panel. Uh, I was just telling my colleague uh, Elizabeth that uh, it's such a magnificent campus. It makes me feel like I want to go back to school, <laughs> but probably not in a STEM field because I was so bad in math that I wouldn't go very far. Um, and, and it was really inspiring to listen to all the fellow panelists today because I think you touched on uh, pretty much all the issues that we see in our work at UN Women when we talk about promoting women in STEM, but even beyond that, about the promotion of gender equality. Uh, and I just want to take a step back, because I think, uh, from the, the specific topic we're discussing, because I think it's really important that we look at the context we're in. Um, uh, we, I think, are really at a historic moment in, uh, in, in the gender equality trajectory. I've been working in this field for about 15 years, and I've seen um, a huge, uh, increasingly exponential level of interest and uh, um, attention to this issue, which was not the case before. Nowadays, issues of gender equality can make uh, a head of government lose its seat. That was not possible before. Um, and, and that's true for you know, many countries around the world. We at UN Women work in more than 100 countries, um, both high-income and low-income countries and middle-income countries. And we have seen uh, a really uh, an increasing level of attention to the, to the issue. And that's very positive. So Dennis, you were saying it's a pivotal moment for Columbia University. And I think it's a pivotal moment for the world, if I can say, in that, in that context. Um, however, uh, what we also see is that there is a very slow progress and it's very much subject to reversal. The backlash against women's rights 
uh, and the backlash uh, against gender equality is very strong. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's one that, uh, um, uh, you know, has a real potential to undermine the uh, progress that we have seen around the world in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, 25 years, really. I want to take that number because uh, that's nearly the, 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 the time that, uh, that, um, that we have between uh, today and the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. So here I come with my big UNEs again, uh, but just to say that this is really our uh, plan of action for achieving gender equality. It's a very detailed plan. It was drafted in 1995. It was adopted in Beijing. That's why it's called the Beijing Platform for Action. And you know, it's so interesting because when you read the Platform for Action, you realize how valid, it still remains 25 years later, nearly 25 years later. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, the World Economic Forum uh, estimates that it would take about 200 years to achieve gender equality just in the economic sphere. Uh, so the progress is really slow and we need to accelerate it. And actually what we have seen through our work at UN Women is that investing in women in STEM is one of the accelerators, is one of the real areas where you can see a big jump. Because the world is facing a major transformation in terms of the labor market, uh, and, and the skills gap that we're seeing is going to play itself mostly around the issue of STEM. So making sure that women have, uh, and girls, starting with girls actually, <laughs> uh, uh, have access to STEM, have uh, exposure to it from an early age, and can see role models, all issues that you have uh, uh, addressed is really important. I was uh, looking at a statistic. We did a study together with the Gina Davis Institute uh, on, uh, on the media and uh, on gender stereotypes in the media. And that study showed that on-screen characters with an identifiable STEM job, among on-screen characters with an identifiable STEM job, only 12% were women. So it means that all of us, when we watch TV, when we watch movies, we're just, and let's say there is a scientist, there is a mathematician, there is, uh, you know, a, a, a startup uh, <laughs> a, a entrepreneur, it's mostly men. It's very rarely women. And that has an impact on our subconscious and on how we see each other. And that can be seen in other studies, for example, that have seen that girls' interest in STEM subjects declined by the age of 15. That's a study by Microsoft in the European, in, across Europe. Um, in, in Finland, for example, 62% of teenage girls said that science was an important field that they find really interesting, but only 37% of them said that they would consider a career in this field because they just don't see themselves. Um, so there is a real work to be done on addressing gender stereotypes in this, uh, in this area, and that's done both on an individual level. You have all spoken about, uh, you know, how you had role models, models both men and women, and having men stand up for women in this field and in other fields is, is extremely important. Um, the men need to open the doors, basically, because they are the ones who, at this moment, often hold the power. And therefore, they need to seize the power. They need to give it away, and they need to uh, bring more women into the... And that's not just true for STEM, that's true for every sector. Um, so, uh, so, so both in the, in the sense of having men stand up for women, but also in women themselves pursuing this field and being pioneers and having more role models. Um, the other area which is extremely important and which you have all referred to as well is the issue of unpaid care work. The fact that women uh, still do globally two and a half more unpaid care work, so domestic work, child care, um, cooking, cleaning, basically in normal language, <laughs> cooking, cleaning, and taking care of the sick, the elderly, children. Uh, globally, it's two and a half uh, times more, but in some countries, it can be more than 10 times more uh, uh, work that they do. That significantly decreases the amount of time that they have to dedicate to their studies, to their careers, uh, and to their, the rest of their lives, basically. So there is a need uh, to recognize unpaid care work, which means that it needs to be measured. It needs to be uh, um, uh, recognized as an activity, as a productive activity. Uh, and therefore, you know, women who are deciding, for example, 
not to get into the labor market because they want to take care of their children should have the same access to social protection than women who decide not to. Um, it needs to be reduced, and that can be done through infrastructure. Uh, once we had an ambassador at the UN say, what do you mean, washing machines? Well, yes, washing machines, this is also important. Uh, and and in here I just want to again go back to the theme of STEM because uh, uh, actually there is, this is also why it's important to have more women in STEM because their experience of their lives is very different. So the innovations that they will bring to that field is quite different than the one that men will bring to that field. And finally, it needs to be redistributed. Redistributed uh, unpaid care work needs to be redistributed between men and women. So parental leave, for example, is very important. I have a one and a half year old. I took four months to be with him last year. And it was an incredible experience that just shows you the amount of investment that you have to make to take care of a small child. <laughs> and I say that after two nights where his mom was traveling. So, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but also redistributed between the state and, you know, the, the, the child care. So, um, so between, um, uh, uh, you know, having more child care facilities, having them affordable, accessible is really important. Okay. This is all the work we do as UN Women and, uh, and, and we do it in more than 100 countries. And so thank you again for giving me the opportunity of speaking about that. So, so thank you each. I th think we've heard a lot about how policies can be instrumental, whether they're at the university level or, or, or at government levels in, in helping to move this field. I, I want to say just briefly um, that because this was touched on a little bit is, um, is the role of industries. Okay, so we talked a bit about universities, we talked a bit about government policies, and that our, you know, our students have incredible opportunities in front of them in industry. And we are, especially you know, in, in STEM fields and engineering, applied science fields, and this um, is an area where we are seeing it's a big opportunity for closing the pay gap. Um, between women and, and men in those in those fields, and also that what we're seeing is because of, you know, some rather, you know, not the greatest examples out there, but that have activated women and men in understanding there are issues in industry that industry needs to address uh, to be a more welcoming environment for, for women in these fields, and they are starting to step up big time to address this issue. So I think there's there's oftentimes something negative that leads to some really positive, um, positive motion in, in industry and in the world that, that um, I, I think bodes very well for, for all of our students, our, our, our uh, male students and our female students. And uh, what, we wanted to have a conversation here, but we were academics, we talk too much. And <laughs> so we're going to go straight to, to audience to Q&A. So please, um, uh, we have a couple of microphones. Uh, any questions out there? <coughs> OK. Hi, uh, my name is Juan Carlos. I'm from Mexico. I'm a graduate student here at Columbia. Uh, actually, I have engineering background. I'm an environmental engineer. I studied back in Mexico. Here I'm doing my master's. But I worked in a couple of manufacturing sites in Mexico. And I don't like to use this distinction, but for the easier purposes of my question, there are like, uh, in manufacturing sites, like blue, white, uh, blue collar workers and white collar workers. Like, you know, supervisors and coordinators are the white collar workers, and general workers are blue collar workers. I have seen that in the white collar workers uh, or employees environment, a lot of more women are starting to work for companies as supervisors, coordinators, managers. But I see that in the blue collar workers, uh, there's like still a lot of uh, like a big gap. Like maybe, for example, in the automotive industry, it's like a 90% man, 10% woman. Mm -hmm. And at least in Mexico, it's like a very different culture, like a very macho perspective. Like really, guys think that because they're strong and they're big, they can build cars. But like with today's technology, we have like a lot of uh, ergonomical, uh, especially like in the bioscience uh, and in the biomedical sciences, we can make, we can adapt the jobs now to everyone, regardless of our preferences or whatever, like we, we can actually do this. So what would you give me as good examples for blue collar workers that we can actually encourage more participation of women or other uh, people with different uh, capabilities or abilities? Thank you. 
So, so I mean, I'll, I'll take a small shot at this. So, so one of the things I, I think that's really important to recognize is that um, having a, a background in, in the, a STEM-related area is critically important for those jobs for jobs across the spectrum of, of, uh, of technology, from what you're calling blue collar all the way up to white collar. What we're seeing is that technology itself is transforming the nature of jobs at every, at every, at every level of, the, of job. And, and therefore, it's also bringing greater opportunity for full equality across, across all these spectrums of different jobs, whether they're in manufacturing, assembly, or, or you know, our office, and, and on up the, 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 the latter type of positions. So I think that's a really important message that you're trying to get at. How do we, how do we get more people into every, and greater diversity into every different type of job? And I think education is key for the future. Okay, that we're transforming almost every type of job to a knowledge-based job, right? So how do we how do we help in all different levels of education? Of course, up here we're focused at the university level, but we're we're starting to look at and think of what, how does this translate into other other levels of education for the jobs of the future? And I think that's a really critical statement you you've made. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may elaborate on that also quickly, also maybe how to encourage like mobility from yes. blue uh, collar workers to white collar. Like you know, yes. I have a few examples, yes. but I think that also men have it easier to do this transition, right. at least in my experience. Right. And I think that there can also be things that we can do for women or right. for uh, and, members and, of the and, LG community. And many community. elements there are are connected to, you know, what what's commonly being thought of as lifelong learning. How are we all going to be learners continuously because, because the job landscape, the, the knowledge landscape is evolving very rapidly and how does that help you progress through, through just, uh, your life? Can I just say, yes. just to add something because that is actually part of what the work that we do uh, at UN Women in, in, in about, uh, we work on women's economic empowerment in about 70 countries. And a big part of our work is about providing second chance education for women who are trapped in low skilled, uh, uh, low paid jobs, which as you, know, you have pointed out, drives, for example, the gender pay gap. Uh, so, so we just launched a big um, uh, program in multi, in, across, I think, 12 countries on second chance education to provide with those women opportunities to get training to, to grow. But what I want to say is that this is not enough. You also need leadership at the top. And this is why, for example, he for she has this initiative 10 by 10 by 10, where we're working with 10 CEOs, where they make commitments to change their companies and their sectors, their industries, to open up uh, uh, these, um, uh, these opportunities for women. Uh, and, and uh, for example, we have seen with uh, one of the partners, PwC, that in a year, they have significantly changed. They have near parity, I think, or, or parity already at the senior level of the company uh, uh, in, um, uh, between men and women at the senior level of the company. In a year, they made that change. So it's possible, but it needs leadership at the top and it needs skills training uh, for the workers at the bottom, so to speak. So, yes. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for speaking today. This was a really lovely conversation, thank you. Um, my name is Honor Harlow. I'm a graduate student in the nonprofit uh, management program here at Columbia. It's my first semester. Um, so I've always felt really passionate about uh, gender equality initiatives in my work and other people's work as well. And I'm now in a geographic location and at a time in my life where I have access to so many opportunities, so much information in regards to gender equality, and I'm just started, starting to get started in this field. What is your advice for the best ways to get started, to enter the field? Um, what resources would you recommend? Oh, that's a tough one. Well, maybe I can, uh, uh, I don't want to monopolize, but uh, since it's a broad question and you and you and women works on gender equality issues broadly, I think it's, it's really important for you to find an area that you feel passionate about. Be, gender, gender equality is a very big 
uh, uh, topic, and, and, and it basically cuts across every single aspect of life, from the individual all, all the way up to the government. So it's really important, I think, for you to find. Today we talked about women in STEM. That's one specific area, which is already very broad. <laughs> So I think for you to find one area which is very specific and where you can make a difference and where you can work, uh, what we have seen in terms of progress for gender equality is the power of activism. The power of activism, the power of mobilization, uh, but also the power of reaching out to those who are benefiting from the status quo but don't necessarily realize that they are. And that's why, for example, our executive director, since she, she came to UN Women seven years ago, has been working really hard to broaden the movement for gender equality. So that is not just women's women, first of all, or, or gender equality advocates, but it also includes men and boys, that it includes the private sector, that it includes youth, that it includes uh, you know, all sectors of society uh, to be committed and to make commitments uh, in their area. Could I answer? Um, I would say that one uh, way you can start your activism is to work within this, just the broad arena of nonprofit organizations. I know in science, um, there are lots of women, and a lot of our graduates go on to work for foundations that focus on diseases, for example, of the nervous system. But the boards usually are um, populated by mostly men. Absolutely. And some of these nonprofits. So, so I would start conversations within your program yeah. to you. expose that yeah. quality. <laughs> Thank you. I think even more at a grassroots level. You know, I think uh, I remember um, there's a Society for Women Engineers, which cater primarily to undergraduates. And then the graduate students wanted to form an organization, so they formed one of their own, which is Graduate Women's Society. You know, for science and engineering, I think it became more inclusive mm -hmm. uh, at the PhD level. So I would say that if you don't have a society, go form one. <laughs> and I think you, you have to, I mean, I think yeah. activism starts at the grassroots, and it, then it blossoms. And I think sometimes you have to be that kernel, you know, that seed of that, that, that movement. Yeah. Okay. And, and I just want to add to that. So you're, you're asking a panel of mostly academics. I would say that you continue the academic path and continue to advise your, your peers to continue to climb the academic ladder, uh, which will can open up doors and, uh, and opportunity and, and that are often closed. So, uh, you know, don't, you want to combine that with your activism and not necessarily jump off of the academic ladder for the activism. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, don't give up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have a question? Hi, um, my name is Hannah. I'm an undergrad from the Washington, D.C. area. I'm studying international relations and education. Um, my question kind of relates more to um, the pervasiveness of sexual assault and harassment within the field of academia. Um, I was reading outside that like, within academ academia, I'm ranked second only to the military in terms of the pervasiveness of sexual assault. Um, so how does, like, first of all, the university, Columbia, especially into, on the graduate level, because I think undergraduate students are equipped with some resources that graduate students are not, deal with that um, in, in terms of creating those safe spaces? And then even for he for she, um, on this tour um, around universities, are there any, any initiatives to hold um, these spaces accountable? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm going to respond from the university side, and I'll say that the, uh, the, the, one of the wonderful things about the university is much of this effort is being led by Suzanne Goldberg here uh, in the Office of University Life. And it has, you know, our response of this university for both issues related to women and, and, and sexual assault and harassment has been just incredible over the last, I would say, five years especially. Um, and it is a challenge that we see across the nation. And we're engaged, we're doing the exact same things, recognizing the issues, we're particularly aware, putting real resources in place and a planning process, strategic planning, so that we can implement the policy changes. I, I would argue it's one of the fastest growing areas within the university at the administrative end, being able to put into place the policies and changes necessary to make it a, a healthy environment for all of us. I would say that just yesterday we got um, 
the uh, uh, sites for looking at our regulations on sexual harassment. At least I got one right. in my email box yesterday. And, and as I said, our graduate students are forming their own advisory groups, and some of our graduate students just put in an NIH grant for mentoring, training on gender bias, on sexual harassment, and on conflict resolution. So it's all bubbling up, I think, right. happily. And, and I would just like to, to say that we are doing the same things at our graduate level. You know, I think wonderfully uh, many things were first initiated to, to address at the undergraduate level, but at the graduate level, we have m many briefings, required briefings for all entering students. There's many things we're doing at faculty right. level. So, so it's, it, this is absolutely being addressed at the graduate student level as well. And maybe if I can just, just broaden a little bit from, uh, from most of the university uh, field. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, as you know, it's an issue that is pervasive of all sectors. For example, at the UN, we have a real problem that we're trying to address. The Secretary General is very committed to responding to it. But the reality is that we don't really know what works, what works well. We know a few things, but the solutions are not that obvious. So I think it's really important to, if someone was talking about conversations earlier, it's really important to have conversations on this issue. And it's important for you or anyone else who has an idea on this could work to come forward and, and, and propose that. Because I think at this stage, we're at, at, at a place where we're really trying to identify what are the good practices. And there are many things that need to be tried that haven't been tried yet. OK. Um, Suzanne would like to make a few statements on this. Well, we did wrap up. Oh, OK. <laughs> there, are two, there are two more questions. There there, yeah, there, let, let us say, we we're, we're supposed to wrap up, but we'd love to ha entertain the two more questions. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't mean to divert the conversation from a really important topic. Yeah. So did you want to make your remark before I ask? OK. My name is Renee Sachs. I'm executive director of the Women Builders Council. The Women Builders Council has partnered with He for She with an initiative that is in the construction and engineering industry called We for She. And so men are opening the doors wider, but women have to knock. <laughs> so if women don't knock, the door doesn't get opened wider enough for you to enter. So I had a question for the audience. How many of you are interested in careers in the construction industry? And I know the young man had indicated before blue collar, but how many of you have looked at careers in construction, such as with the major construction firms that are building the Columbia University campus? Could I see it? May I ask for a show of hands? <laughs> Astounding. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there are six and seven figure careers in the construction industry for women who are interested in working as engineers, as construction managers, as project managers, as CEOs, CFOs, HR professionals. So many, many opportunities are there in the construction industry with, at the same time, a dearth of, of new talent. So there's not enough talent. The construction industry is aging. They need engineers such as yourselves. And I encourage, I come out of the academic. I have a PhD I, in linguistics, actually. So I was very interested in Dr. Mason um, and her studies in the area of neurolinguistics and what's going on in women's brains. Because if we could figure that out, we might be able to reduce sexual assault. However, however, I'm just wondering how many of you have actually begun to explore that. And what can the Women Builders Council do um, our president, Deborah Bradley, is here today, and Tanya Pope is one of our board members. We have 36 of the leading women in the construction industry who are breaking the glass ceiling. And I'm just wondering, I didn't mean to be that enthusiastic about this, but I think it's an interesting fact that many of you have not looked at the careers. And two, there are organizations outside of Columbia. In Columbia, we're working with Columbia now to start a student chapter which might enable you to talk to other women who are in the field, who are on the job sites. This doesn't address, again, the blue collar issue, which is another issue and almost a subject of another discussion. But for those women who would like to get into mid and upper level management and really run the projects and build New York 
and the United States, there's great opportunity for you. Okay. So I just want you to so, bring that to your so attention. So we'll be, we, we're going to connect you to the great women students we have in our construction management program. So yeah. uh, we'll connect you after that. But we, but want, your, we want your engineers as well. <laughs> well in, our engineering, our construction management program is an engineering uh, degree. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Elena and I wanted to address two of the questions that have been mentioned because I think there's some relevant information. One, I'm co-president of Women in Science at Columbia. Yes. We are a group of grad students yes. um, and do, we do a lot of events and outreach and actually we have a symposium last year and Dr. Mason was a, our speaker. So um, you, anyone who's interested, you're welcome to um, come talk to us. Um, and second, regarding the, the sexual harassment um, topic, there's a, I wanted to bring your attention to a whole conversation that's been happening on science Twitter. Um, but if you don't spend as much time going through Twitter as I do, you probably haven't heard of it. There's a movement called Me Too STEM, and it's spearheaded by Professor McLaughlin at Vanderbilt University. And one of the things they're trying to do is in the wake of the, um, the National Science Foundation has changed its policies, so it's a stricter sexual harassment policies, so it has the Society for Neuroscience. So what they're trying to do is push, push the NIH to, um, for those <coughs> faculty members who have been found guilty of sexual harassment to actually take them out of study sessions, um, training grants, withdraw funding. And what I think NIH has said so far is that that's pretty hard for them to do because they can't just take away funding from one lab, they would have to do it for the university or, or something like that, I'm not super sure. Uh, so what they're trying to push is for that to happen now. So, so there are repercussions beyond, you know, you're found guilty and you still have your, um, your thing. And so I, I know I'm just throwing this at you and maybe it's not something you've heard about before, but um, in the wake of the whole Jessel debacle and everything that's happened, um, is, does Columbia have an opinion on this or, or maybe would be willing to consider um, implementing those types of quote unquote punishments? So, um, you know, there's some yeah. negative feedback, not just for a specific faculty member, but a repercussion for the university because it seems like historically that's been the only way um, something has changed. Thank you. I'd like to have Suzanne Goldberg address that. But this is, this is a movement that's gone beyond just taking away grant funding. Right. Um, there's been another movement to take away honorific um, appointments yes. to the National Academy and so on. Um, but that is a very large question and one has to ask, there are many, many people we don't know about who have had offenses, made offenses, but have not been reported. So it's a larger issue. I think perhaps we can, do you want to say something about that from the university's perspective? So, so, so Sam will say some closing remarks, but what, what I, I'll say, and I'm sure uh, Dennis and, and Helen will share this as, as well as Carol, of course, is that this is something the university takes extremely seriously and deeply, um, and uh, you know, and is is doing a lot of proactive things to encourage reporting. Okay, it has to start with reporting. Okay, that we we need to know if there's an issue, and we need to to get to the bottom of it and then take action. So I would say for sure it's very important that there be reporting um, so that we are able to actually address absolutely. these issues. And this is ex and absolutely taken at the, the, uh, the, the deepest level across, across all faculty and on up to the president's uh, position. So do, do not think this is not um, being addressed. Uh, and with serious, the, the most serious ramifications. Um, I, I would, so Suzanne can come up, but I want to say uh, in, in those lines, but not as in, in, at the, the level of um, ramification that you're talking, I think an, another very important area in, in, in that sort of landscape, which was mentioned very briefly here, but, but one which I, I think is critically important is the area of, uh, of unconscious bias and implicit bias and what that um, means in the uh, progression of women and, um, and persons of color um, in, 
especially in scientific and engineering fields. And we do quite a lot in, in those areas. Uh, I know within engineering, every search committee is, is given training on, on those issues. Um, and we also have, um, uh, we'll be having a more detailed, to, you know, we have briefings on it for faculty and students, but we also are having workshops coming up for faculty, graduate students, postdocs in those areas. Um, that's at a different scale than what you're we're referring to, but I just want to say this is something that I think the entire academic community, um, uh, particularly here at Columbia, is, is working on. Suzanne. My, my main job right now is supposed to be to ask you to join me in thanking the panel, which I'm going to do and then say a little bit more. Um, because it's, it's really an extraordinary conversation and I've been working on gender equity issues really my whole career and actually since I was a student. So to sit and listen to all of you who have worked so long in areas somewhat similar to mine and completely different and hear the many different ways that we can think about how to reckon with where we are, how to appreciate the gains we've made and also how to have an imagination and vision for what we might achieve going forward. I, I do want to say something very quickly related to the two questions about sexual harassment and assault and then I have two other quick points and then uh, we'll invite everybody to, uh, to join me in thanking the panelists again. The first is really to echo what Dean Boyce and, and uh, Vice Provost Mitchell and others on the panel have said, which is that at Columbia we do take uh, 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 reports and incidents and information that we receive about sexual harassment, about sexual assault, about other forms of gender-based misconduct, stalking, relationship violence, extremely seriously. There are many resources for students. If, you don't, if you're not aware of them, I'll just tell you that if you have a concern or even just a question, you can always call the Gender-Based Misconduct Office and, or stop by or, or go on the Sexual Respect website or the University Life website. You find links every place because we often have a lot of questions. We're not sure if something was okay, or we're sure, but we don't know what to do about it. The Gender-Based Misconduct Office has people who are called case managers, whose very job it is, is to sit with you, to talk through the issues, to address your concerns, to help explain the processes, and then to help you move forward. We also have confidential resources here, including sexual violence response and counseling services, who, can, who are entirely confidential for you to, to raise concerns and questions. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that, that Dean Boyce said, but, I will, I, but I'm happy to elaborate at, another, at other sessions. And I also want to encourage everybody right now, as you know, everyone who's a student should know, this is the period of time when we have the Sexual Respect and Community Citizenship Initiative. All new students are required to participate. All continuing students are encouraged. Among the many opportunities you have, are to join a session with our University Title IX coordinator, Margie Fisher. Uh, she's a fantastic presenter. She's available to answer lots and lots of questions. And so, oh, and there she is, right? Margie, can you just stand up? There's Margie. You can see her right after this session as well. So I do want to encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities. And again, always, you can always get in contact with me at University Life for more questions. Now, three quick points, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. First, um, when I started, when I, when I welcomed our panel and our event, I talked a lot about the importance of conversation. And related to conversation is the importance of creating community. So one thing I'll ask you to do before you leave is to turn to the person next to you, or if you know the person next to you, then the person behind you or in front of you, and introduce yourself, say what school you're from, a little something, because one of the ways we change the conversation on these issues is to strengthen the fabric and build of our community and to build that community. So please be sure to remember to do that. Um, second, I'd invite you to share the video, the live stream of this session on, on your social media or however you choose to share it. You can find it on University Life's website. Third, 
out right on College Walk is this super cool looking bus that says he for she on the outside. And there is lots to do, I guess, in there and to learn. There's you know, interesting things and fun things and I'm sure swag type of things. Um, so, that, so go visit the bus, get your friends to visit the bus as well. And really uh, now I want you to please join me in thanking he for she for being here in partnership with us at Columbia and our extraordinary panelists for their insight and leadership on these issues. And now there will be one video that we can enjoy together as a community, then do your introductions and go check out the bus. Thanks very much for coming. As a girl, I'm expected to be your little princess. As a boy, I'm expected to be your hero. I'm supposed to play with dolls and look pretty. I'm supposed to play sports and act tough. Crying makes people think I'm hormonal. Crying makes people think I'm weak. If I spend more time at work than at home, I lack devotion. If I spend more time at home than at work, I lack devotion. People will question my sexuality if I choose to join the army. People will question my sexuality if I choose to be a nurse. I'm expected to define myself as a boy or as a girl.